the speculators, the people who are tied to Wall Street, those are the ones who would do well in an inflationary environment. The people who have a fixed wage, they're clearly going to be hurt by a sudden surge of unexpected inflation. These statistics aren't showing the dangers of capitalism. They're showing the dangers of fiat money. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, August 8th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, August 8th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Stephen T., and today our guest is Dr. Robert Murphy. He is an economist, broadcaster, and senior fellow at the Mises Institute. He's president of consulting at Buy RPM and is the prolific author of many, many books, Many, many books, including Contra Krugman, Chaos Theory, Lessons for the Young Economist, Choice, Cooperation, Enterprise, and Human Action, and his latest work, Understanding Money Mechanics, which is scheduled to be a game changer um, that will be seminal for use in schools and textbooks, and is scheduled for release later this year by the Mises Institute, and which will be the subject of our interview today. He's also the host of the acclaimed Bob Murphy Show and Podcast. If you're wondering where you managed to find time to do all that, you're going to have to ask him. But this show is essential viewing for many, where he talks about everything ranging from his vast knowledge of finance and economics to, to even what undergirds him and his worldview in terms of his Christian faith. He's also graduated from NYU with a PhD in economics, and is widely regarded as one of the brightest young, well, <laughs> youngish, I should say, economists working today. Welcome to SBTV for the first time, Dr. Murphy. How are you doing? And as a start, can we call you Bob? Well, thanks, Stephen, for having me. I'm doing great. And yes, you can certainly call me Bob. I prefer it. All right, absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll call you Bob then. And well, Bob, given your depth in teaching and writing as an economist, uh, well renowned, your books are are used as textbooks by professors and in schools, and, and we're thankful to God for that. Today, we're going to focus on helping our audience learn from your ability to make things easy to understand for us, um, demystifying highbrow academic stuff and bringing it to the common man, if you like. Um, let's start with money creation, Bob, um, because you wrote, and um, as always, a fantastic piece titled, and this is the title right here, Four Myths, Myths About Money That Ought to Die Forever. Wow. And in it, I'm just going to quote you here. The first myth is that money is a claim on goods and services the way a bond is a legal claim to future cash payments or the way a stock or a share is a claim on the assets of a company. You write, on the contrary, money is a good unto itself. And later on in the piece, you add, if we truly wish to understand money, we must distinguish between credit liabilities on the one hand and a universally accepted medium of exchange. Now, Bob, where do you see this myth most commonly perpetuated? Well, I see it in casual conversation, um, you know, like on the internet. Not, I mean, people type it out, but where I saw it, and that's what made me put it into this article that you're uh, quoting from, is, is people would say things like, like if someone was complaining or, or warning that, oh, the US dollar is in trouble, a lot of times the defenders would say things like, oh, well, you know, the, the dollar just reflects the strength of the U.S. economy. And really, the dollar is just, you know, it, it's, it's a claim ticket. Like when you work, you get claim tickets or, or credits giving you, you know, entitling you to some portion of the total that's produced. And that's really what it is. They're, they're viewing it like you go to a factory, you work, and then you get like a claim ticket. And then you go to the store and you turn it in and say, oh, see, this ticket's showing how I put in the work. And so I, I am owed some of these goods. And even though I understand why people might think like that, I think it, it fundamentally misconstrues where money gets its purchasing power from. And that that's, I mean, so it's, it's not correct, number one, but even beyond that, it's, I think it's, it's not merely a harmless fiction. I think it, 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 it leads people to misunderstand how money gets its value. And so as an Austrian economist, I want to make sure that people, you know, don't, don't go awry at step one. Right, because Bob, given what you've mentioned about the Austrian school there, there's Menger's view of the origins of money, which which says it's actually a good or commodity unto itself. Um, would you say in that sense that gold and silver, uh, they can be directly exchanged as commodities, even though they, they can be really bulky in that sense? But I mean, is that why um, fundamentally, because gold is a good or a commodity unto itself, 
Bob, is that what you're saying? Is that why gold and silver in that sense is? They're regarded as universal money. So uh, there, I think there's two different claims. So it's true that I do think commodity money, historically, gold and silver, you know, were the market's choice and that people left to their own free choices, you know, gravitated towards gold and silver as the world's monies and had governments not interfered with that deliberately, you know, people would have continued to use them, you know, past the 1930s and past the 1970s. So I do agree with that. And you're right. That is intimately tied to uh, Carl Menger's explanation of the origin of money. But even the, the point I was making about, you know, uh, like the U.S. dollar is not a claim on goods and services. That's true even in our current fiat environment. So, so right now, w- when people hold a hundred dollar, you know, they have a hundred dollar bill, a Federal Reserve note. Th- I, my point is simply to say that the reason you can go exchange that for a certain quantity of, of real goods is not because it's in any sense a claim on them. It's just that the, the, the recipient considers you know, his, his expectations of the future and so on and is willing to make that trade. Just like if you go if, if two students at school, one has a bologna sandwich, one has a peanut butter sandwich. If they make a voluntary trade, you wouldn't say, oh, it's because the bologna sandwich was really a claim on the peanut butter sandwich. You would just say, no, they, they considered what they had and they each walked away with more utility subjectively conceived because they had different preferences. And so likewise, when you spend $100 at the store, the merchant values the $100 bill more than the goods, and you value those goods more than the $100 bill. It's not that the money was somehow a claim. So that, that's, that was the simple distinction I was making. No, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, it, 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 it's because it's like um, money emerges out of voluntary acts, uh, actions, and out of um, the direct exchange of commodities. Um, that, that's what you're saying. Right. Yeah. So fundamentally, yes, the same way you you would understand or explain people making a barter transaction, that's the same framework that the Austrian economists use to explain where does money get its value from. The, so in other words, money is not some totally separate object that you need a different value system or you, that you need a different theoretical mechanism to explain its value. You use the same tools that you use to explain barter but then once you understand that, you can understand you know, why money is special. So money is very crucial to an economy, but the way economists and the, you know, the public should think about it is not that it's this qualitatively different good. Um, Bob, just going through another of your articles here, gold and silver fast emerged as the money of choice because they satisfied all of the criteria of what makes a medium of exchange. Uh, durability, you listed, divisibility, homogeneity, homogeneity, I should pronounce it right, easy to transport. But at the same time, you were saying um, it would not be practical for shopkeepers back then to do metallurgical tests on precious metals for each and every transaction. Obviously, that was not possible. So goldsmiths started acting as the ones who capped the metals and issued IOUs. And then basically the government stepped in at that stage to come up with a uniform coinage system legally backed by the state and government, of course, like a sort of government-backed token system and then held in the banks that would replace the goldsmiths um, so that people didn't need to carry the actual gold and silver around and people could simply carry the IOUs or the receipts or eventually the notes to function as a medium of exchange instead. And Bob, can we say that need to be practical in the past? So all the way in the past, the need to be practical is still applicable even now today. Um, in that sense, um, marrying commodity money to a paper claim is sort of, in that sense, unavoidable or even inevitable. Well, I don't know that it's inevitable, but yeah, just to elaborate on some of the, the discussion there. So what I was saying in the article is that, you know, what, what is money by definition? It's a medium of exchange that's universally accepted in a certain, you know, among a certain community. That's what money is. But then to understand, okay, what sort of commodities make a good money or a convenient one. And, the, and yes, the attributes you listed. So it's easier to look at the other way, like why cattle, even though in some communities historically may have served as a, as a money function, or at least as a valuable asset beyond just the direct use. It's, you know, you gotta, you gotta feed them. They make a mess. If you, if you want to spend half of a, of a cow on some, <laughs> on a transaction, it's hard to get the change right for biological reasons. So that's why cattle 
did not become the, the world's money. Um, and, but then also, too, things like diamonds. One, one might have supposed, well, how come diamonds didn't become precious you know, commodities that served as money? Well, because they're heterogeneous. Like to have a pound of, you know, a one pound diamond is far more valuable than 10 one tenth pound diamonds or kilograms, whatever you know, unit of weight you want to use. Whereas with gold and silver, you can just melt it down and it's pretty homogeneous. You know, it doesn't, it's the, the size of the chunk doesn't really matter that much. Whereas with diamonds or emeralds or rubies, it does. And so that's why, yes, those, those items, those precious gemstones are valuable, but they're not, they didn't, they wouldn't, wouldn't make a good money the way gold and silver and, and copper do. Um, so, th- so that was that point. But then, as you mentioned, even so, it, it's inconvenient if, let, if the silver is money in a community and you go into the store to take out an actual you know, hunk of silver and then have the shopkeeper have to evaluate it to see, is this really silver? How much is it? Uh, oh, if it's too much, you know, how do I make change like to only take a portion of it? So that's the reason for coinage. You know, to take the gold and silver and stamp them into hard to duplicate objects, you know, metal discs that have, uh, you know, shape or around the circumference, you know, they have the ridges and so forth to make it hard for people to shave off some of it, which, you know, historically happened and, and, and tests like that. So that, that's the, the, the reason for, for coinage. So it's not that minting it into a coin transformed it, right? It really was, it was just signifying this is a certain weight of gold or silver. That was the function of coinage for full bodied coins. And then, as you say, even that, be, you know, there were certain instances where that wouldn't be convenient for large purchases or for security reasons. And so that's why, oh, some people, wealthy people would deposit their precious metals, even in the form of coins with a, with a banker, for example, and then get, you know, some sort of claim. So there's a reason for all this evolution of these things and private coin or, or coinage, I should say, historically, private mints did a better job of that than the government. So that, that's not something that intrinsically is you, that you need government to perform private mints historically, you know, made beautiful coinage and they had the right incentives to avoid counterfeiting and so on. So that's all stuff that could happen in the voluntary sector. So now finally to circle back to what you were asking me, yeah, nowadays those things would all evolve too, but it's, it's important, I think, to understand the fundamentals each step of the way, like why, what is it that makes something a good money commodity? And then why would you want it to be in coins? Why would you want to have paper or nowadays electronic claims on it? to facilitate large scale transactions and so on. So that's, I think the, the, the evolution of the, of the reasoning. And um, so, so yes, any, whatever's going to be the money in the today's global economy, people are going to have paper or electronic claims on it, but it's still many people believe that underlying base money itself should be a physical commodity item. Um, you know, and there, there's still a lot to be said for that. Right. So, so it's not so much um, the fact that it's both government backed and tied to the metals as much as it is tied to the metals. That's your anchor point, isn't it? Uh, that's what you're saying, isn't it? Because even today, some people might even argue and say, hey, government backed doesn't mean uh, or we haven't count for much anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah certainly. I'm, I'm most familiar with the US situation. But here, you know, people put their money in the bank and they think it's safe because, oh, we have what's called FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And not after the 2008 crisis, it was increased to $250,000 in your checking account. But if you go and look at the, the actual web, you know, government website and look at their reserves, it's they, I don't remember the exact number, but it's something like they have 1% or something like that. You know, in other words, if the banking system really did take a hit, they really only have about one, they could only satisfy 1%. So it's yes, they, and there's moral hazard, as I'm sure you and your, your viewers understand that by the government telling people, telling Americans, don't worry if you put money in a checking account, it's safe, we guarantee it, then nobody does any research. The average person, when he opens a checking account with Citibank or Bank of America or Wells Fargo, they don't go and look at their loan portfolio to see, is this a safe bank? They don't care. And so then that gives the bank reason to be riskier with their loans. Um, Bob, you had written that the gold standard worked pretty much like a check and balance on the government, um, where the government on one hand backs the gold standard by making the standard offer to redeem their own paper currency. This is in the past, of course, with with the gold standard. Um, And um, redeem their own paper currency with a specified weight of gold. And this actually 
you, you were saying that this actually discourages them from printing all this money um, because people would, even back then, people would, you know, they would, um, it would affect the flow of gold in and out of the country through arbitrage as people would just trade the gold through arbitrage. Can, can you explain how this mechanism really works? Sure. Uh, and I want to stress that originally, historically, it's not merely that like the central bank, like the Bank of England, the Bank of France, you know, the, the German uh, central bank, the Federal Reserve. It's not that they had their own um, sovereign currency that was a paper notes and they and they had like a, a, a peg. Right. Right. So nowadays it, we could imagine if various central banks wanted to sort of link their currency back to gold or a basket of commodities of which gold was a prominent component. That would just be sort of like a, like a peg or a pledge or a target. And that would be better than doing nothing. But, you know, you could. But I, but I want to stress for your viewers, historically, that's not what it meant. For example, in the, you know, I, I know the most about the United States context. Originally, like in 1792, there was a coinage act and it defined the dollar as a certain amount of grains of gold or silver. Right. So it wasn't that they said, oh, the dollar will redeem it at these ratios. It was saying that's what a dollar is. The federal government up through 1861 did not issue paper notes that were dollars. Instead, it just said, if you want legal currency, if you want dollars, bring a certain weight of gold or silver to a U.S. mint, and we will stamp it into coins that label with the appropriate number of dollars. And that's like a $20 gold piece has a certain weight of gold in it. And the, the general public can bring that amount of gold and we'll stamp it into a coin that says 20 U.S. dollars. And that's the official money. So the number of dollars, in a sense, was endogenously determined based on the definitions, right? So it was more like saying one foot is defined as 12 inches or one meter is defined as 100 centimeters. That was what it meant to say the dollar is this amount of gold or this amount of silver historically. So um, in terms of the, the what's called the classical gold standard, which prevailed before World War I, you're right that because the dollar was defined as a certain weight of gold and because the british pound for example was defined as a certain weight of gold it implied an exchange rate between the us dollar and the british pound it was about four dollars and 86 cents per british pound and so if the us government printed too many dollars well then that would push up the dollar price of the pound in the foreign exchange markets and that would set up an arbitrage opportunity where people would turn in their their paper dollars for gold ship the gold across the Atlantic Ocean over to London, turn that in for pounds, and then use the pounds to buy dollars in the Forex market. And they would end up with more dollars than they started out with. And so that just shows the mechanism. If the US government printed too many dollars, ultimately gold would flow out of its coffers over to, for example, the Bank of England's vaults. And so that was the ultimate check. So that was true for all the countries that participated in the, on the, in the international classical gold standard, again, which dominated right before up to the eve of World War I. And so all the governments of the world had this check. If they printed too aggressively, they would lose their gold to the other companies that were more, or countries that were more conservative. And so that limited inflation. That's why historically prices did not just keep going up and up and up in the, in the heyday of the classical gold standard. There might be periods where there was an inflationary boom, but then when there was a bust, prices would come back down. So that uh, you know the price of a well-made suit in the United States from 1800 to 1900 was roughly the same measured in dollars because you know the, 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 the dollar was tied to gold. Quick question about Gresham's law here, um, because you've talked about bimetallism, um, Bob, which was a dual standard for both silver and gold and which ended in 1874, as you write. Um, and you were saying that the tort is that, is that, excuse me, unless the implied value ratio of the two metals is close to the actual market exchange rate, one of the metals will necessarily be overvalued. So it started back then in the US for all of you at 15 to one, which was the ratio set by the market. But then Inevitably, over time, one metal would be overvalued. Um, Bob, you've written that when people talk about bimetallism, they often talk about Gresham's law, summarized in the aphorism, bad money drives out good. Um, were people holding on to the undervalued money and getting rid of the overvalued money? Um, is that 
how Gresham's Law was linked to biometallism back then. Are, are we right in an understanding that? Yes. So great questions. And yeah, everything you said is right. So I'll just elaborate on that for your viewers. So uh, yeah, in the U.S. context, it was the coinage acts of 1792 that established, like I said, it, it defined what is the, it, just for people's history. So the, the U.S., you know, there was the, the revolution in 1776 when the 13 colonies broke away from Great Britain. And then they had a period of the Articles of Confederation and then the U.S. Constitution. And so 1792 was very early in the modern version of the U.S. federal government that was established under the you know, what we call the Constitution. So um, at that point, again, they defined the U.S. dollar. And the reason they used the dollar was because this different currencies had been circulating in the colonies and the Spanish dollar was one of the most popular. So a lot of Americans just thought of prices in terms of dollars. So that's why that's what you know the, the, those people chose as the U.S. unit of currency. So it was defined as a, a certain weight of gold or silver. And the ratio of the two was exactly 15 to 1 in 1792. And the reason they did that in terms of the statute was because, as you say, the global world market at that point, it was, you know, gold was about 15 times the value of silver in terms of kilograms, the, the market value. And so they were they wanted to be a bimetallic standard because they wanted to facilitate coinage of both metals because for large purchases, oh, you have a $20 gold coin. That's, you know, that's very convenient for a large purchase. But then for smaller purchases, gold was too expensive. Like the, the coin would have to have so little gold in it, it would be cumbersome. So instead you'd have silver coins for, for transactions of smaller market value. And they wanted to have both. So that's why they said, oh, 15 to one, because that's the right ratio. But then the world price moved to about 15 and a half to one. And so at that ratio, given that the U.S. authorities had pegged it at 15 to one, now silver is overvalued and gold is undervalued. And so it becomes a silver standard. Then that's where Gresham's Law comes in. So yet to answer your question, yes, people, when you go to make a purchase, you're going to spend the, the, the metal, the coins that the law is sort of overvaluing, and you're going to hoard the ones that are undervalued. So in, in our modern times, just to give people an, an understanding, if, if I have a U.S. quarter that was minted in 1950, there's actual silver in there. So it's worth in its silver content is worth much more than 25 cents. So it would be foolish of me to spend that quarter today in a transaction where I'm just getting 25 cents for it. I would I would instead spend the quarters that don't have any silver in it. So that's to show the, the coins that are being spent in, in circulation are the ones that have the, the lower you know, metallic content. And so historically, that's what would happen, that government, it wasn't just the United States, governments that had bimetallic standards, depending on the market ratio, either the silver or the gold coins would sort of be overvalued. And that's the one people would spend because you're getting more on the face value of the coin than the actual metal content would fetch you if you melted them down and sold it as bullion. And so that's, it's, and it would alternate based on how the exchange rate or the, you know, yeah, the exchange rate between gold and silver moved in terms of commerce. So that, so yeah, Gresham's law is summarizing bad money drives out good. What that's getting at is the idea that the money that's being overvalued, that's actually not as good as the law says it is. That's what everyone wants to get rid of when they spend and people hold or hoard the money that's better than what the official law recognizes. And so that's why they, what they mean by saying bad money drives out good. You only see in commerce the money that's actually not as valuable in terms of its content. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Murphy. Now, returning now to your article about the four myths of money, uh, you also added that one of the four myths is that, quote, under a gold standard, the money is backed up by something real. Whereas under our present system, dollar bills are backed up by faith in the government. So on, on a surface reading of this statement, it would seem rather, rather okay. But for you, it's not that you disagree with this statement in theory and, and call it a myth. Am I right? Um, but you're saying it's the imprecision of the wording that you are disagreeing with in, in, in terms of, of, of the myth. So there's a certain sense in which those words could be could mean a statement that I agree with. But the way I see people in practice talk about that, it's I, I have concerns with. And so that's I think that's what was driving that, you know, my discussion that you're quoting from. So, again, specifically, it, it sort of ties back to the earlier myth that I talked about. 
where people think that the U.S. dollar nowadays somehow reflects the strength or integrity of the federal government. And they'll look at things like, oh, here's the assets on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. And let's see if those are quality. And, and that's what they're using. And, and they're treating it almost as if Federal Reserve notes are bonds that the federal government has issued or that the U.S. Treasury or the Federal Reserve has issued. And I, I think that that's fundamentally mistaken, that the, the U.S. dollar does not, again, it's not a claim on the U.S. government. They're not promising you anything. And, and to understand why does it have purchasing power, you say, oh, the reason I sell my car for 5,000 US dollars right now is because I forecast, I have expectations that those $5,000 will have purchasing power next month. And, and so really I'm doing a calculation, the goods I can get next month with the $5,000, do I value those more than my car right now? And that's why I would do that trade. It's not because, oh, these $5,000 are somehow a claim on the US government and I trust the integrity of the US government. So the, the one sense in which the, the, that statement is correct is if, if what the person means is I trust that the Federal Reserve won't be too reckless. So I trust that they're not going to print $10 trillion next Thursday. And so that's why I'm willing to accept dollars today is because I trust you know, their, their sanity. So in that sense, okay, but the way people often talk about, uh, oh, the US dollar is no longer backed up by gold. Instead, it's backed up by your faith in the US government. Again, I'm, I'm concerned that some people might misunderstand what that means and think that the dollar is somehow a claim when, when no, it's not really a claim on anything anymore. Because some people even say, you know, um, oh, it's fine if the dollar crashes, the dollar is still backed by all the assets held like the military or the raw materials and natural resources in the ground. <laughs> so, so what do you say and what was your take on that? Right. So that's a great example. And that's that's what I what I mean when I say I think that's the, a bad way to look at it, because you could imagine you know, if there were some small, you know, if Hong Kong or, or, you know, some small area of people declared their independence and their sovereignty, and they issued a currency that was defined in terms of gold or silver, for example, then that could be very valuable. That could appreciate year after year against the dollar, against the euro, the yuan, so forth. And it wouldn't be because, oh, the, the GDP of that area is bigger than the U.S. or the China. You know what I mean? It's that's that's the wrong way to look at it. It's really not um, you know, based on the economic fundamentals in the sense that I think a lot of people mean. Um, and so, it, it's again, it's not like looking at a bond that a corporation issues and trying to figure out, are they good for this? Because it, if, if the if the U.S. dollar is not a promise for the U.S. government to do anything, then it doesn't matter what its finances are like and so on. Right. Again. All this, though, is just to indirectly say the reason you might be worried if they keep running huge deficits is that you're worried the Fed's going to print more dollars or electronically or, or physically to cover the deficit. And so that's why you might be worried about the future of the dollar based on the current profligacy. But again, it's not because they have to redeem it. The dollar is just what it is. Um, and, and, you're, and you're right, like things like the U.S. military, where that's again, that's not. That, that's not really an indication of why you should value the currency that that organization issues. And in fact, you know, there's, I'm sure you're familiar with, there are people that wonder if U.S. foreign policy sometimes is influenced by like Middle Eastern governments that are trying to get off the petrodollar. So whether that's true or not, but my point is, if anything, that would just show that the, they have to resort to violence to sort of try to prop up the dollar. And that's, that's hardly an indication of, the, of, of its strength and vibrancy. Now, I, I just want to shift off of that now to um, all the way up to the post-World War II and the Bretton Woods era, uh, the Bretton Woods system, because you know our, our time is rather short. Um, the Bretton Woods system, um, a global financial system resting on a refined gold exchange standard in which the US dollar was the reserve currency. Uh, Bob, you wrote that by 1968, the Americans had capitulated and let the unofficial price of the dollar, the market price of the dollar, that is, deviate from the official Bretton Woods value, relying instead on diplomatic pressure to dissuade other governments from exploiting the discrepancy and, inverted commas, running on the Fed's in increasingly inadequate gold reserves. And by 1971, 
President Nixon would remove this gold standard entirely, and the world would operate on a purely fiat monetary system. The Nixon shocks, as they, they're known. Um, a couple of days ago, Professor Jonathan Levy um, at the University of Chicago was speaking to the BBC, and he was saying that in all of world economic history, 1971 marks the fundamental turning point. And we're still working out the consequences of that till today. Um, do, do you have any kind of a response to all of that? Okay, so I didn't see um, Professor Levy's remarks, so I don't know whether I would agree with what he said. But from what you just said, yeah, I would agree with what that statement. I don't know if it's in the same spirit of, of what he meant, but it's interesting. There's lots of statistics um, when people worry about wealth inequality or income inequality. It's interesting if you look at the charts and they, they'll, they'll show things. I'm making up these numbers, but this is the spirit of the kind of thing. I mean, they'll say, oh, look at uh, from this period to this period, wage earners only gained 10 percent, whereas the upper one percent, they gained 200 percent and, th and things like that. And so it looks like wages aren't keeping up with productivity and things like that. And if you look at the, the charts of these things, very often where this turnaround happened was not in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan. It was in the mid 1970s. It was like around 1973 with the recession you know, that happened there. And so my point has always been to say, right, that's exactly what you would expect because in the early 70s, the Nixon administration formally severed the dollar's last remaining tie to gold. And that gave the Federal Reserve permission or the ability to print dollars recklessly you know, to fund Vietnam and the, the war on poverty and, and so forth. And that's what, what you would expect to see, the, you know, in terms of running the printing press, which groups would benefit? Well, the speculators, the people who are tied to Wall Street, who, you know, have very liquid funds and can, and they earn their money through speculative investing. Those are the ones who would do well in an inflationary environment. The people who work at a coal mine or who go to a factory to make cars and they have a fixed you know, wage that's set in a, in a contract that maybe they get to negotiate every year, they're clearly going to be hurt by a sudden surge of unexpected inflation. And so I'm saying these statistics aren't showing the dangers of capitalism. They're showing the dangers of fiat money. You had an interesting article from 2011, and I quote, I'm just going to quote you here. Unfortunately, even though the proponents of sound money can all agree that FDR's actions in 1933, and as, it, and, and as you just talked about, the Nixon shocks, and Nixon's actions in 71 were despicable, they can't all agree on the best way to reverse those catastrophes. So, for example, suppose the government does indeed link the US dollar back to gold. What price should it use? The current market price? The Bretton Woods era price of $35 per ounce? the pre-Roosevelt price of $20.67 an ounce, end quote. Um, Bob, do you still hold to this view all these years later? So, yeah, my, my thinking on the gold standard has evolved over time. So when I was younger, I was so fascinated by it and so enamored. And, you know, it was just such a great mechanism. And I thought it was being so unfairly denigrated by modern economists and the general public. You know, the general public is taught at least in the United States, I can't speak to Singapore or Australia, but the modern public in, in America is taught that, oh, yes, we used to have the gold standard, but it caused the Great Depression. And so thank goodness we got off of it, right? That's sort of, as if it were a voluntary choice that Americans made to leave gold when, no, it was in, Roosevelt threatened people with a 10-year prison sentence and a huge fine if they didn't turn in their gold. So that wasn't that Americans decided to go off gold. They were forced to at gunpoint in the early thirties. Right. So that's, that's what, how partly how they weaned America off of gold. But um, so yes, but and so, and so because I thought that was such a better system than the fiat system, it's true. I had spent some time and I even wrote some proposals for here's how the U S like the federal reserve could announce, Oh, instead of targeting CPI or, or you know, um, core CPI inflation at a certain 2%, instead of announcing its targets like that, or instead of announcing targets for the federal funds rate, what if instead the Federal Reserve just said, we're targeting the price of gold at $1,900 per ounce, period. And that's it for, for the rest of time. And you know, we, we promise we will intervene in markets and buy and sell gold on our balance sheet. And I was toying with the idea, but the, 
eventually I've stopped doing that. So I'll still argue and explain that the gold standard didn't cause the Great Depression. The gold standard was a great check on inflation and so forth. But I'm no longer in personally putting a lot of effort into trying to get U.S. authorities to go back to it because they would just abandon it whenever a crisis came back. And so I realized it would discredit commodity money if, I, if, if they were to do that. And so instead, what I advocate in terms of government policy is just give people freedom, like change the tax code so that if you're working with gold and silver coins as the money, you're not going to get hit with capital gains taxes you know, as, the, as they appreciate while you're holding them, things like that, or just other uh, regulatory constraints that make it difficult for people to transact using precious metals rather than fiat money. Right, because because that was what um, a JP Cortez of, of also from the Mises Institute. Now he's with the um, the SMDL. Um, he was saying similar things. Um, now, our SBCV team were actually discussing your writing, uh, Bob, and um, Vincent was saying, "Hey, would the, the government have a problem coming to a consensus on what gold price to use? Since the Bretton Woods era price clearly that already priced the risks perceived by the market in." And um, in that sense, can it be argued that the fixed prices of the Bretton Woods and the pre-Roosevelt era, they will not work in tandem with the money printing? And some would add, hey, remember the London gold pool failed because the market won and the fixed price lost. I'm not sure if this is answering your question. So Ludwig von Mises had the, the best proposal I have seen for how, could you know, given that governments abandoned the old either the classical era or the Bretton Woods era um, ratios that, you know, like you say, it used to be $20 and 67 cents. And that should give your viewers some idea of how much dollar inflation there has been that before, you know, in the early 1930s, an ounce of gold was only $20 and 67 cents. That just shows how much, how many dollars have been created since then. And then the $35 an ounce, you know, was the, for several decades up until 71. Um, and so Mises had a proposal. I think he wrote it in the fifties, I believe to say what they should do is just look at what the, the, the market price is and just say, okay, going forward, if anyone wants more U.S. dollars, they have to bring that many ounces of gold you know, to the proper authorities and then be issued what will be legal tender. So in other words, the U.S. authorities will not print more green pieces of paper that say $20 or $100 on it unless people bring to the government the right amount of gold and then they put it in the vault and that's in a sense backing up the new money. So it, w- it wouldn't instantly switch to f- fully 100% gold backed money, but over time it would, you know, it, it would asymptotically approach that because from that point forward, any new dollars created would be backed up 100% by gold in the, in the U.S. vaults. So that was his proposal. And again, he was leaving it to the market to decide. He was saying, when you announce this new policy, just look at like a month period and what's the average price of gold in terms of dollars, you know, once people know this is coming so they can adjust and maybe the price of gold changes based on this new information, but go ahead and make the announcement saying, you know, starting next year, this is what we're doing. See what happens to the dollar price of gold and then just lock that in. And that, that's the thing going forward. So that, so that was the way Mises proposed if the U S government were serious about tying the dollar back to gold, that's that's what he recommended. So if they were going to do it, that's the way to do it. I'm just saying I personally, I don't trust them. Even if they were to do that, there could be a new administration in 10 years. And if there's a big financial calamity, they would just abandon that and it would further discredit people say, oh, see, gold doesn't work. Because back in 2011, you suggested that Ben Bernanke, the then Fed chair and other Fed policy makers, that they could go back on gold immediately by switching from targeting the federal funds rate, the um, interest rate between the banks, to targeting the price of gold. Um, And you recommended that the Fed's holdings of treasury debt and other assets, that as they matured, um, that you should replace them with physical gold. Um, do Do you still think that this is a valid proposal today? Right. So, and it, yeah, there, what you're describing, you're, you're exactly correct. That is what I said. And that's what I meant when I said I used to, you know, I even had proposals. I'm saying, yes, that right. when I was, was when I was explaining to people, you know, that this is how the classical gold standard worked. What a great system. It had checks on government. In 71, there was an awful decision. Look at how much, you know, it's not a coincidence that we had 
double digit CPI inflation in the US in the 70s, right? Soon after they got rid of the, the link to gold. That's not a coincidence. It's not that inflation was OPEC's fault. It was, you know, the, the printing press. So that was, so you're right. So then people want a solution. And so I say, okay, yes, rather than Ben Bernanke, you know, the Fed chair at the time when I was giving these talks, rather than him buying mortgage backed securities and treasuries, which just sort of rewards bad actors, instead, they should be let, let those assets, you know, as the mortgage backed securities and the treasuries mature roll those proceeds over into acquiring physical gold. And so that to, to give credibility that if the Fed's going to target a price of gold to tell to show world investors that it's serious and credible, they would have large stockpiles of gold with which to maintain that that pledge. Yeah. Right. Just like the Chinese authorities, if they want to say that, oh, we're going to have a dollar one ratio, they need to have a bunch of treasuries. To, to back that up, to show the world. If we need to intervene in the currency markets to s- support our currency, our peg, we can. Likewise, if the US government is announcing to the world or the Fed is announcing to the world, the dollar is going to be 1900 an ounce or whatever the number is, period. They need to have stockpiles of gold to support it in case the dollar is getting hit and that, you know, and the price goes up to 2000, they got to be able to sell gold for dollars to push the price back down to, to whatever the target is. So, yeah, that was my role. If the Fed wanted to do that, I would be happy and I'd be I'd much prefer that system to what they're doing now or that regime to what they're doing now. I'm just saying I personally have stopped pushing that because I don't trust the Fed to stick to it. And so I'm not going to waste my time getting public support for the Federal Reserve to do something where I don't trust those people. Hypothetically speaking, I mean, how would such a move impact the gold price for that matter? Well, yeah, exactly. So that's that's why. um I think I told you a minute ago in Mises proposal, I think that's why he said, you got to first announce this is what you're going to do in the future and then let people react because you're right. If the fed were to say next week, Hey, we're going to let half of our balance sheet roll off and replace it with gold. Well, that's a lot of gold they would be accumulating. So that's clearly going to push up the price of gold immediately as, as speculators realize, Oh, wow. The demand to hold gold, you know, from institutional investors, all of a sudden is going to go up a lot. So, and that would affect also when the Fed promises a certain dollar price of gold, if they were to do that regime, they would have to take that into consideration to realize if we make this move, that's going to push up the dollar price of gold, other things equal. And so let's not set the target too low. Otherwise, you know, our move is going to be contradictory. Well, uh, Dr. Murphy, I have taken up a lot of your time. I don't want to hold you up any further, but because you've taught us a lot about money today and we, we, we do really appreciate that. So thank you so much. I just want to, however, end by coming back to your article about the four myths of money to look at how you deal with the final myth. And, and, and this is the myth, um, just to quote you, the purchasing power of money equals the supply of real output divided by the supply of money. So that's the myth that you've quoted. Now you were also saying that prices are not a mechanical function of physical stocks of goods and dollar bills. On the contrary, people's subjective valuations are also critical. Um, That's what you were saying. My question is, when we talk about the purchasing power and devaluation of the US dollar, a lot of people will say, hey, you know, the uh, purchasing power is going down as the devaluation of the currency, the US dollar is on the way. Um, And by expanding the monetary supply, by printing more money, it sort of functions like a hidden tax. The expansion of the money supply functions like a hidden tax to inflation of the money supply. It's a form of theft in that sense um, from people who do not know how to protect and hedge against the erosion of their purchasing power um, through money printing, excuse me there. Um, And for example, by buying silver and gold to hedge against that. So how do you dovetail this conventional understanding of of, of the purchasing power being lost with the response that you gave in debunking the myth earlier? Okay, yeah. So great question. So it's certainly true, you know, as a first pass, if you're just talking to someone who, you know, doesn't have any knowledge of of how money works and inflation and, oh, you know, gee, what, why doesn't the government just print a million dollars per person and make everyone a millionaire? Right. So someone who's at that level of understanding. Yeah, I think it's perfectly fine to say things like, well, just think about it. If they double the amount of dollars, that wouldn't make more cars. That wouldn't make more factories. Right. So it can't be that we have that more people have cars because the same the same number of cars 
to go around. All it would tend to do is make the price of a car double, right? And so you get people thinking like that. So I agree, like at a very elementary level, to just think in terms of how many dollars are there and how many real goods, and it's a division problem. That's that's a, a good way just to warm people up so they understand printing money doesn't make society richer the same way you as an individual. If you get twice as many units of money, you're a lot wealthier. That's not true for society as a whole. But what, what I was getting at, though, is that's really, you know, it is just a pretty basic point. And then fundamentally, it's not true that if, for example, they double the supply of dollars, prices might not double or some prices might more than double and other prices might not go up nearly 100%. So it's not it's not a mechanical thing. It's not like an engineering problem. It, prices always work through you know subjective expectations. So to give you a different example, even if the Fed didn't create any new dollars, if the Fed just said, starting in two months we're going to create thirty trillion new dollars and drop them from helicopters, that would make prices in dollars right now go up immediately, even before those that new money hit the system, because people subjectively would get you know value dollars less and try to get out of dollars because they know this future policy is going to happen. And so you would see dollar prices going up right now, even though no new dollars were created. So I'm just, I'm showing that, you know, in reality, prices and voluntary transactions always go through the subjective evaluations of the two individuals in their minds. And so money prices are not merely an arithmetic issue. It's not merely an engineering or a technical issue it's ultimately going through subjective valuations. Well, I'm afraid that's our time um, because you've got to run, obviously, but we hope to do this again. And um, thank you so much for all the books you put out there because it's educational. And uh, this book coming up, it's uh, coming up at the end of the year, isn't it? Uh, Understanding Money Mechanics. Right. So uh, the, the online version, we were releasing them serially. That's all done. So the chapters are up there. People want to go and look at the online version right now. Yes, we're just compiling those together and I'm, you know, proofreading to make sure there's no typos and thing, but yes, to have a physical book and, and yes, certainly this calendar year, it will be available. I don't know exact date. And, and Bob, uh, before we wrap up, uh, could you let our listeners know more about how they can find your work? Uh, Cause we understand you're a prolific writer and you have a blog as well. Am I right? Sure. sure thank you. Um, so my personal website is consulting by rpm.com. But also, if, if it's easy to remember, people can just go to bobmurphyshow.com. That's where my podcast is, and that has links to everything else. Yeah, the, the Bob Murphy Show, essential viewing, and uh, no shameless plug involved here. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Robert Murphy, Bob as we call you, for coming on the show and giving us your time today. It has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Well, thank you, Stephen, uh, for the interesting questions. And I hope uh, your viewers got something out of this. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, that was Dr. Robert P. Murphy, Senior Fellow at the Mises Institute. For more information about his work and his views on the economy, you can read his articles at www.mises.org. You can also check out his own website at consultingbyrpm.com slash blog. And Bob can also be reached on social media on Twitter at the handle Bob Murphy Econ. Now, if you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SPTV channel to be updated on new content. To also check out the SPTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify as well.